All right, everyone, welcome back to the Your Passion Podcast. Today we interview and get to know the story of Michael Canavo, co-founder of Super 73. A little backstory on Super 73. Um, it's an electric bike company that has worked with people like Sway Lee, Casey Neistat, Jesse Wellen, Snoop Dogg, Post Malone, and many more creatives. And they enable uh, people to go anywhere and everywhere with electric bikes. So let's get to know his story. Bingo. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much for having me on. I'm excited. Yeah. Um, so just a little bit to get started with yourself. Um, how did your love for Star Wars begin and just really explore <laughs> into that? Because I'm super curious. <laughs> we're getting we're getting right into the Star Wars. Side yes. Of things. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it's it's wild. Um, like I you, grew up. Like, a, like what, were you watching that? VHS tapes or like, were, yeah. was it? Yeah, I, uh, I grew up a Star Wars fan. Um, I mean, I remember being incredibly young and mm -hmm. um being at my my grandma's house and and seeing uh return of the jedi yeah. and it was on tv it was some holiday it was on tv and uh the speeder bikes just like changed my life yeah. just completely i was like what is this i became instantly obsessed speeder bikes were always like that fixation point for me uh when it came to star wars mm -hmm. was these space motorcycles um and as you can tell uh you know 20 years later um I'm, I'm, I'm actually doing it. You know, we did the uh, speeder bike project through Manhattan. We recently did a bike for Rahul, uh, Coley that had speeder bike sound effects, mm -hmm. uh, built into it. So I'm doing the best I can to turn my love of star Wars into something real actually functional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what was it like, uh, I would guess volunteering or being with the 501st or like what, what was that experience like? Cause I know they're wow, super you, you big. Did more, you did, you did more research than, than I normally get. Uh, yeah. yeah I, so I, I personally, um, credit myself on doing like two research, two weeks of research minimum. And then I'm like, wow. let me get to know the person. So yeah. So tell me about that. My goodness. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I was, uh, working for myself, I had started a, uh, a like a little wedding video company. Mm -hmm. Um, and I it just gave me a lot more free time. And so I was kind of looking at hobbies and I always wanted to build a, a helmet. Right. Um, so I went on eBay and I kind of like found some, some sort of materials I could buy and then went on these props forums and was looking around at like building helmets. And I kept seeing the word 501st show up, but I didn't really know what that was in reference to. So I just kind of skirted by it. And mm -hmm. over the course of a summer, I learned how to uh, lay fiberglass and and basically built uh, a very really rough suit of armor. Um, but then there was, a, uh, there was a book signing I went to for a new Star Wars novel that had come out. And so I brought one of the helmets I made and I showed up and there was like all these people in armor and yeah. I was like, what is this? And I was holding a helmet. So they come up to me and they're all acting cool. And they're oh, wearing their dope. like, you know, after, <laughs> yeah, afterwards they're wearing their like denim jackets with their patches on it. And they're like, um, Hey, are you a member of the 501st? And mm -hmm. I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And within, uh, I think a week of that, I was, I was on my path to becoming a member. I built a suit of armor, um, had some help from some awesome guys in the community who I'm now best friends with, uh, to this day. Um, and yeah, that's kind of how I got started on my journey. It didn't, it didn't last, uh, in the, in the costume clubs. It, it wasn't necessarily for me after the long run, but, right. uh, it, it connected we, me with uh, every dude that was in my wedding mm -hmm. was from the, the costume club. Wow. Uh, my wow. coworkers. Yeah. The guy who I share an office with, I met through the costume club. Uh, we got a, about a half a dozen employees mm -hmm. here through the same thing. So yeah, it was pretty instrumental in all of this. So it's just like a giant social community of people who interested and share the love and passion for star Wars and actually make clone trooper suits with their own yeah. um, taste and feel of it. Yeah. That's it, it. I think it's amazing. Cause like I personally, like I wouldn't say nerd cause I feel like nerd has like the wrong context or like idea, but like I'm super yeah. passionate yeah. about star Wars as well. And like, I saw your suit and I'm like, man, I want to figure out how to make one. I'm like, do I 3d print one? Do I need to do paper mache? I'm like, oh, how did they just yeah. look so cool. But yeah, I'm, I'm also a big fan. Um, getting more into it. Um, do you prefer, cause my brother debates me on this. Do you prefer the 2d version of star Wars clone wars? Or do you prefer the 40? I don't know if you know about the 2d version. It was the one where it was like, you don't know. Oh, co okay. Come on. You don't know if I know. I, I, come on. Just curious. Like, just yeah, curious. <laughs> like, I, I mean, listen, when it's, there was a long period of time where we were getting no Star Wars content. Uh -huh. So it was like, I found every bit of Star Wars content I could find. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, you know, the, 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 
what do you what did you call it 40 uh, uh, yeah so the 40 version is like what we have now and then the the 2d version right. was like the flat that's the yeah. tar, uh, tar, tarskovsky yeah uh I'm, I'm butchering the way that you pronounce that but that's i fell in love with uh fordo Mm. through that he was one of the main uh the main clones and obviously rex is my boy and that's that's yes. you know the 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 uh the animated series is what i become a big fan of the one that just wrapped with season seven recently um but I, it was definitely very instrumental i actually built a fordo helmet um so, so i'm definitely a fan of both one more than the other maybe a little bit but yeah mm -hmm. um what do you think of the ending of mandalorian i know it's like it's a whole nother can of worms but like what do you think of the ending and from my point of view, I thought it was kind of cool because I felt like compared to the movies, it showed you like the perspective of like just an ordinary person living in the Star Wars universe. Like how actually powerful is a Jedi compared to like a bounty hunter? Right. T did the whole wrist rocket thing and it didn't even take out the dark troopers. And I'm like, OK, well, what the heck is it going to stop it? And then it just comes in at the last minute. What do you think of the ending? I was right there with you, man. I mean, I, I think you hit you with the, the nail on the head with like perspective. We got to see. Um, Luke Skywalker through a normal person's eyes, right. which we had never really seen before. We got to see a legend, like a, a myth um, come to life. And so uh, I, I did a, a live uh, recording of that where I, I shared my reaction to it. And it was just like pure awe yeah. and surprise because I didn't think they would have the guts to put <laughs> Luke Skywalker in the Mandalorian. Exactly. And sure enough, they did. And um I mean, what a time to be alive as a Star Wars fan. Like what a, there's so much. Content, there's never right? been a better time to be a Star Wars fan. Mm -hmm. So true. There's just endless stuff with like Disney Plus now and you can just get into fandom and communities. It's a whole. Yeah, it's like a giant can of worms. Um, getting more into business um, and from your perspective of being an Orange County kid and my perspective of being an Orange County kid. Um, what was your life like growing up in OC and um, how do you think it's different from other people's experiences in Orange County? Yeah. I mean, the word I just, uh, the word I jumped to is you have to admit the the privilege of growing up here. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and we all have our own struggles and whatnot, but, but to be physically where we are is something that I, uh, there's so much of the success that that's attributed to because you're so close to LA, you're so close to San Diego. Right. Um, you get to rub shoulders with the top professionals in every field, whether if it's athletes or marketers or entrepreneurs, everybody kind of circulates through Orange County. So it just kind of opens more opportunities to you. Now, growing up, it was just wonderful to be able to play outside 12 months out of the year. Right. Um, but as I started to, you know, go to high school and, and then afterwards, like figuring out what I wanted to do, even growing up down in Orange County connected me with some of the top YouTube creators in LA mm -hmm. back in the, the days of Vine. And if it weren't for me living in Orange County, I would not have had those opportunities, mm -hmm. um, which I know that you probably experienced to a certain degree too. It yeah, just it's, presents more opportunities. Yeah. There's a giant, like, I feel like there's a giant social network around here and, and people say, you know, it's about your network, not your network. And I believe that's very true about like who, you know, in Orange County and the relationship you have. And then also, just like we're doing right now, we're expanding relationships and getting to know people's stories. So I feel like that's super crucial when it comes to living here. Um, when you graduated high school, did you want to go go to college and did you know what you wanted to do? Yeah, um, man, that was rough for me because I, I always thought that college was the only option. Yeah. Um, and so I had my sights set on the Air Force Academy. Um, and I had done everything I needed to do to check the boxes. I got the, the, the signatures I needed to get. I got the, you know, the extracurriculars I needed everything. Um, and I made it through quite a, a few rounds of selections and then basically just got cut on the final round. And, mm. and their reason was that I was not, um, uh, like I just wasn't competitive enough. Got that it. was, that was literally the reasoning was, Hey, we're sorry. You're not competitive enough. Um, and so that kind of left me with no idea. I, I ended up going and getting a job for Verizon spinning signs on the corner uh, in San Juan Capistrano because I had no other options. I didn't have a backup plan. Did you feel kind of, um, not regret, I would say, did you feel a little bit of angst or like hate towards that? Or did you just let it go at the time? Or like, how were you feeling? Um, it's a, for anybody to say they don't feel a certain way after being told that they're not good enough to do something that they've always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's a feeling we've all felt at one point or another, but what's, 
what really matters is what you do with that feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, I sat there and I sulked in that feeling for a couple of years. Like I, I became somebody who existed, who I just basically was going from job to job, making enough to pay rent, playing video games every single night, just kind of burnt out because I kept going back to, well, I wasn't competitive Mm -hmm. enough. I'm not good enough to get to where I want to get to. I actually assumed, you know, I got a job at Costco after a while and I was like, well, this will be the rest of my life. And Mm -hmm. thinking back on that person, I wish I could have slapped myself awake a lot sooner because I, as like a 21 year old was resigned. I had resigned to the rest of my life, which happens so often. Did you, um, did you have a moment? Cause I felt like I'm also getting into entrepreneurial stuff and I've talked to other people who started the businesses. Did you have a moment while you were working your nine to five where you thought, man, I could be doing something really better, but I just don't know what it is and I got to figure it out. Or did you not have that moment? Oh, absolutely. Do you ever experience that feeling of like, I'm wasting time, but I don't know what to do? Exactly. Like I, yeah. I align with that. And like, I've talked to, um, we've had some other music artists on the podcast and like, I've talked to them about it and they're like, yeah, dude, I just, I was focusing on making music earlier, but I don't know what to make. And I just didn't want to be at work. So yeah, I definitely align with that feeling. Um, from there, what did you do or like what job moved you forward um, that led you to starting yeah. Super 73 or co-founding? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it became a matter of like, I wanted to make something remarkable yeah. every single day. And that word remarkable, it, for lack of a better word, it haunts me to this day because it has become like a part of my very DNA where everything I want to do, I want it to be remarkable. And, and what does that mean? Well, I want people to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I want it to be something that causes people to talk, whether it's making a speeder bike or going viral on TikTok or, um, you know, creating a whole company. I want everything we do to be something that's worth talking about. And I think that's that mentality you have to have, especially when you have uh, no accountability. When I'm working at Costco, every single person around me is working in this same echo chamber. So all we're being told is this is the best you can do. This is the best job you can get. And it's a great job. Like it was, it was honestly really fun. It's like a fraternity working at Costco. It's, it's a cool family, but I I kept waking up with this anxiety and I would be walking in to clock in, looking down at my work shoes and I'd have a pit in my stomach. That's like, Mm. you're not, this isn't for you. Um, as much as I was having a blast, you know, at the time doing it, there was always that anxiety in there that was like, this isn't, this isn't where you should stop. You need to keep going. Um, and I think that's really what, what kind of caused me to eventually, um, move on. And and I've talked about it a few times, but I, I got zapped pretty bad at Costco. Um, I touched a live wire on a pizza display and it, uh, woke me up for, I mean, honestly, that's, that's, it's poetic, but it's true. Um, I nearly died. Yeah. Yeah. It shocked me. Um, I was, I was shocked for sure. Uh, I, it was that moment where it was like, take that anxiety inside of you and know that you can't waste any more time mm-hmm. because all I was doing was wasting time. I was goofing off, making pizzas, closing and getting home at 11 PM. And that was wasting my time because I knew I could be doing more. Mm-hmm. Um, so from there, did you, did you say, you know what, I'm done with this? Or did you say, all right, I'm going to start doing this experiment or doing this side project or w- what was your next step? A naivete has been one of my strongest tools in my toolbox mm-hmm. because you don't know what can kill you. It basically is, 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 <laughs> is how that went is I didn't know how difficult it would be at the time. And so I was like, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit Costco. I can make wedding videos. And I was making wedding videos for like 200 bucks a pop, Jeez. like cheap That's, wedding yeah, videos. That is super cheap but I was making like three or four a week. Mm. And then I started to raise my prices and I was like, I could supplement my Costco paycheck with this. If I raise my prices to 500 a wedding and I just do two weddings a week. Um, by the time I was done doing that, I was charging between three and 4,000 per wedding. And I was still doing the same number of weddings. I was averaging with 50 weddings a year. Um, and so it was, I was feeling pretty good about myself. Um, I was feeling like, okay, I I've got some momentum. I'm doing some cool stuff. I'm like the top wedding videographer in orange County. It's what I wanted to be. I had a sticker on the back of my car that just said best wedding videos ever.com. Oh my God. That's and hilarious. that was enough that like <laughs> it caused a lot, lot of buzz because like mm-hmm. what a weird website name, but it was about being remarkable. Right. You're not going to, you're not going to forget that. If you have a wedding, you're not going to forget the website, best wedding videos.com. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so it was kind of that those little things I did while, while I was still at Costco that allowed me to, 
to get out so that when I was shocked and I did see, like, I did imagine my mom coming to like identify me and I was in an apron and a hairnet. I was like, okay, I cannot let the fear of failure keep me from doing something valuable with my time, doing what I want to do with my time. And that's what got me out. So it was, it was a culmination of things, but a lot of it was not knowing any better. Right. And, and just taking a leap of faith. Mm -hmm. Um, so how did you form a relationship with AP and, um, how did you guys finally decide to say, you know what, let's step out and let's, let's make it happen. Uh, yeah. So I, I was take that season where I'm making wedding videos and mm -hmm. I'm at the top and I was like, this is it. And, and I was seeing that my income was just stuck. I couldn't do more because I couldn't film more weddings. And so I thought, what are people in the creative space doing? And I found some marketers online that were like, hey, we go around and we make commercials for people and we just take 1% of equity from the startup and we do all their marketing for 1% in hopes that that company pops off. And I was like, I can replicate that and I can do it kind of like quick and dirty. Um, and so I found about 17 startups within Orange County. Um, and that was just by searching Orange County startups, yeah. uh, getting their addresses. And I just made a bunch of silly looking dumb folders uh, with the current company name I had, which was Acros, uh, Acros Media. Mm -hmm. And Acros is Greek for utmost, like the pinnacle, the highest. Um and so I, yeah, I made some kitschy looking, uh, flyers and I just went to startups and I got a crazy amount of interest because I wasn't charging many money. I was doing this on my own time where I was saying, just give me 1% of your company. Let me do it. Yeah. Let me do it. All of them failed. Every single startup Jeez. that I got Jeez. equity in failed. Yeah. And that's the, and that's the game. It's hmm. the game is that you are going to lose way more often than you're going to win. Yeah. get used to losing. Uh, but along the way, one of the guys I met was Aaron, Aaron Wong. And, um, he was currently at the scooter company called nimble. They had been doing it for like two years and, and I joined in and, and the company was just, it was just not going where it needed to go. And it was ahead of its time. It was like cargo scooters, but it was before the bird and the lime and the Uber, like the, mm -hmm. it was before all that. Um, and so, we were out of money and we were in a bit of trouble and it was like, we couldn't keep roughing it because my life savings were running out. His life savings had run out. And then there's a handful of us that were doing that. So over the weekend, we developed a mini bike mm -hmm. that had fat tire wheels an electric motor and electric battery. And we launched it on Kickstarter and we thought like, let's just see, uh, let's see what happens. Let's yeah. just, yeah. yeah, let's just see how this goes. And, uh, and that was the birth of super 73. So it was out of the ashes of a, of a dying company we were able to build super 73 and we had enough materials and machinery around from our failed company to be able to kind of pivot and make mm -hmm. bikes from there. Um, did you take your wedding video expertise and did you like, were you in charge of marketing or like, what, what was your official position there? And what'd you do? Right. Yeah. So I was always co-founder CMO, mm -hmm. uh, chief marketing officer, but we didn't use the CMO or any of the C titles for like the first three years because what am I CMO point. of myself? Like yeah. there was no department. And so, uh, we just, we called ourselves co-founders. Um, it was way less, uh, it felt way less snobby and, 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 <laughs> and, and, you know, we felt like we were posers if we were going to say CMO. So I was responsible for all the marketing, all the viral marketing, um, anything that basically was content based, uh, I did. And, uh, it was, it was really just myself and, and Aaron has a really good eye for, for design and brand. And so he was able to come along me a lot of, uh, alongside me in a lot of that and be like, here, let's clean it up this way. Let's change it this way or put this on it instead. Cause he did all the branding for the company. Okay. Um, and so it was really kind of like those two things coming together that created this sort of kind of cult viral hit where suddenly every A-list celebrity is riding a super 73 and, and, and we have not paid a single one of them to do it. And that's what was so wild about this whole thing. In the beginning, uh, what were the problems that stood in the way? Was it welding things fast enough? Was it figuring out how to ship things, logistics? Like what was like the it problem that you guys were like, okay, man, we got to figure this out. Uh, everything, <laughs> that's everything a long from, from buying the batteries without realizing we needed to get certifications mm -hmm. to, uh, not understanding even basic bicycle law in the mm -hmm. US and our first original bikes like didn't necessarily meet the laws that we meet now. Um, we were just figuring it out. I hadn't rode a bike in like 10 years yeah. uh, when we started this thing. And so it was very much like 
we were, our audience and our community was growing with us. And luckily we, uh, LeGrand Cruz came along very early on in the process. Uh, he was supplying motors and batteries for us in the beginning. And he was like, what you, you guys, what are you doing like this? What is, what's up? This, this needs, you need my help basically. And we were like, we do need your help, man. We are just, we are just making cool videos and, mm -hmm. and we don't know what else to do. Um, so LeGrand has an MBA and he had kind of the business side of things. So he came alongside us and just completely overhauled the way we do things. Um, completely brought in this new sort of legitimacy to the business, this ability to communicate with vendors properly, to uh, get all necessary um, paperwork done, to mm -hmm. make sure that everything was properly licensed and, and approved. And I mean, you know, even when the tariffs hit uh, back in 2018, um, he had foresight to move our production before that. So mm -hmm. we were able to avoid tariffs when a lot of other companies got hit with them. So having him come on board was was really a saving grace. And that's just a credit to the collaboration behind a company. No one person makes the company. It's, mm -hmm. it is equal parts collaboration. Yeah. So he was really like, I would say the whole glue that really stuck everything together and pushed things forward, uh, progress and business wise. De definitely business wise. I mean, you can't, it's, it's hard to, to make a viral hit. Um, I, I would say it's even potentially even harder to make it a viral hit over and over and over again. And mm -hmm. he gave us the ability to do that by building a business structure within what we were doing. Mm -hmm. What was, um, or who was, yeah. Who was the first creator that took you guys on and just preached and, and just told everyone about you guys? Um, so it was, which wild, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if you'll remember, um, Andy Milanakis from yes, MTV. Yes. Hilarious, total meme dude. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. I, it's such a bizarre thing and, and we have a great relationship with him still, but he was a part of the Kickstarter campaign. Wow. And, uh, he reached out and he was like, Hey, I love what you guys are doing. I'm a big fan of Kickstarter. Can you bring up a couple bikes for myself and my buddy, Jesse? And, uh, we were like Andy Milanakis. Yeah, of course. It was the first is. It was the first anybody who reached out to us. And, and, you know, while he was potentially at the time a little bit beyond his prime in terms of content, mm -hmm. um, it was a, a little bit of a signal to us that, hey, something might be working here. So through Andy, we actually met Jesse Wellens. Wow. And Jesse Wellens is, is kind of the real story here. Um, but I wanted to get that Andy part out because that's just Credit. wild. Mm -hmm. Andy connected us. With Jesse, we got along so well and he understood the product so well that we were like, well, let's co-brand something together. We're coming out with this new bike. It's going to be the S1. Um, why don't we take your Rose Ave brand and attach it to our brand and um, we'll, we'll launch a bike together. Uh, yeah. That thing went crazy. Jesse was not getting big numbers on his videos at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he posted that, it cleared a million views real fast. Uh, the orders were in magnitudes we had never seen before. And this was off the Kickstarter platform. So this was just through that video. Mm -hmm. And uh, it went really, really well. And it made Jesse really happy. And so it kind of incentivized him to keep working. At the same time, a model by the name of Coco Rocha yeah. Uh, yeah. was going to Fashion Week. And she was wearing this copper outfit. So she said, hey, can you make me a Super 73 that's plated in copper? I want to ride it down the carpet. It's just a whole thing, um, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So it was kind of those two concurrent things at the same time where it was like, whoa, what super 73 is on both coasts. What are they doing? It was a cool kind of loud fashion. It was all fashion based. It was always like fashion lifestyle, Supreme sort of stuff. And, uh, and it really clicked with people. And then from, from then on it is, it is, I mean, you, you, you listed a few, it's been wild, the types of people that, that are coming through here. Mm -hmm. So from there, um, did the Casey Neistat relationship begin? Cause I was super into Casey. I was super into Jesse when he was making like PVP videos and I knew like he yeah. split off and he did his own thing. So, uh, did Casey reach out to you or did Jesse say like, Hey, let's do this speeder bike thing. Or how did that come to be? Yeah. So Casey was kind of like the whole time, like, let me have one, let me have one. And yeah. we were like, no, no, <laughs> no. Uh, we know how you review things. It is not where we want it right now. You can't have one. And he loved that. He was like, respect. Nobody's ever said that to me before. Like, cool. I really appreciate that. And so we began, uh, our relationship with him where he would be checking in. Hey, mm -hmm. do you have a bike that's like up to standard yet? And we we're like, well, almost, we're almost there. So by the time he got a bike, he had been waiting for like a year and a half. And, uh, and that's when he did his review. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's, and that's, uh, you know, we, we, it's, it's sad about boost and kind of what happened with them, but, um, they didn't collaborate with him. Mm -hmm. They refused to let him come on and, and share his creativity. And, his and as a result, there was a little bit of an opening for a new electric vehicle company to step in. And that was us. And, and we, you know, gave him the respect he wanted and collaborated with him in the way he wanted. And so he loved that. And then, you know, following that, uh, was the speeder bike project. And that's where he was like, you guys, this company is, you've Amazing. got it. Like yeah. whatever it is, you're doing it right. You need to keep doing exactly what you're doing content wise. And, and that's kind of what we've done from there. Um, with Jesse, I knew you guys did a gold plated, um, bike. And I think that was mm -hmm. supposed to be meant for Bruno Mars. And then you guys got it to post some loan, but how did, how did that even story go? Or like, Walk the, me through the Bruno that. Mars thing is, yeah, that's a funny one. Um, I think Aaron mentioned that a couple of times. We, we never even, we, like we made a, a gold plated bike right? and we were like, this is super cool. We 24 karat gold plated bike. And we talked a long time about getting it to Bruno, but we never really like put it in the universe. Yeah. Um, excuse me. You did. And, uh, and it just, it just sat there and, and I had it locked through the front tire and the frame because people would just try to ride it all the time. And I was yeah. like, stop, this is precious. This precious. is something special. Like, and, uh, and then Post Malone came along and I was like, this is Post Malone's bike. Yeah. Um, and we, uh, we, uh, posted it on Instagram. I said, Hey, Post Malone, I got your bike. Um, come and get it. And that attracted all sorts of attention, attention from everybody except Post Malone. Uh, <laughs> we great. had uh, a, a good friend I made through Vine, Garrett Watts. Um, he was like, hey, you got Post Malone's bike? I'll come down and make a video about stealing it. And mm. so he did that and that video blew up. Damn. And then we went to Coachella off of that momentum with Jesse and that whole thing is documented. We did not really have an in with Post Malone yeah. when we went to Coachella. We thought, hey, he'll be here. We're gonna just we'll chase him down. <laughs> Hopefully the gold bike will get us through. We ended up spending like an afternoon with Snoop Dogg. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to every VIP party. And this is, I had never been to Coachella. And it was like, Your first I time, showed up. Yeah. And because of the gold bike, it just, my arm was covered in bracelets Jeez. for all the VIP parties. Because when you show up with a 24 karat gold plated bike, it's just so dope. every yeah. <laughs> every producer wants that bike in that party so mm -hmm. that they can say it was here. Um, and everybody started referring it to it as Post Malone's bike. But Dang. we- it was no we had, not official at the time yet. Yeah, he didn't know. Yeah, he didn't know. We were like we're trying to get it his there. name. <laughs> yeah, and I was a huge fan of Post Malone. Like, me, like day one, like this guy was cool. Um, and so it was something I really wanted. And we found out it'll be shooting a music video. And so we went and we we kind of talked to one of the guards and we were like, look, this is a gold bike. Brought him in and it worked. And and you can I'm sure you've you've seen that video that that you were referencing. Um, it is crazy how that happened it, yeah. it wasn't staged we were literally just standing there and waiting we're waiting a few hours Jeez. and then he just kind of walked off set and was like hold on i need to go see this he came over the bike and we went riding for like 30 minutes and riding with post malone was a wild experience um because i was just i mean at the time i'll tell you i had probably negative 250 bucks in my bank account mm -hmm. i was so broke i, I couldn't like jesse uh, took care of the Airbnb for us. Wow. Like he paid for the gas to get there. Wow. Like good dude, real good dude. Yeah. He, he, he took care of us for sure. Um, and so to be in a position where I'm like trying so relentlessly to make something work and then finally it clicks Done. Yeah. and post Malone is tearing down, uh, Palm Springs or, or, or tearing down through the desert on a super 73 was like mind blowing. It was cool. It yeah. was real cool. So you really felt, was it more like accomplishment or did you feel like, all right, everything's going to be okay. He's going to post something. We're going to get some more orders or like, what, what were you feeling of, of like hope at that time? Or like, what was going through your head after it was over? Yeah. You know, relief is a better word than accomplishment. Mm -hmm. I think even today, I don't know how often we allow ourselves to feel a sense of accomplishment, but relief is a, is a better word because it's, I'm checking something off of a giant to-do list. Right. I've got a, a never ending to-do list. And every time we do something really cool, I'm able to check it off and say, now we can focus on the next thing. And so with post, it was about like, I didn't know what, what was going to happen. I didn't know if that would stick. I didn't know if the content would work. I didn't know if people would appreciate it. 
luckily it cemented us as, as one of the cooler brands of, of, of that year, but it was such a, at the time it was like, this could do nothing. Uh, so we have to keep going. So even while we were at Coachella, we were trying to make more deals and get more bikes to more people. I was meeting, I met with like the, the CEO of Levi, uh, jeans. Cause I was like, what can we do for yeah, you guys? What's next? Um, yeah. So it was always about networking and staying hungry. Mm-hmm. Um, what music, uh, I would say during that time, what music were you listening to? Or like, what music do you listen to today? Just like going into that music department of like things. Yeah. Uh, I mean, definitely at the time I was just like obsessed with Post Malone. Oh, yeah, of like, course, of course. Is, is, but I would say that if, if you were to say like, who's the artist who, who made you who you are? Yeah. Um, two, it's so random, but like 2010's Childish Gambino. Wow. Donald Glover in yeah. the mixtape era. Uh, I saw him at uh, the Glass House in LA and I had never felt more motivated in my entire life. And that wow. helped with my awakening. That really helped with my like, oh my gosh, this guy is telling his stories through his songs and I resonate with them. And 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 I understand this feeling of wanting to do more, be better, or, or even feeling like you're running out of time. I've got a constant feeling of like I'm running out of time. And, and Donald Glover really beautifully expressed that through his early mixtapes. Um, and then small, weird, fascinating note is that I was standing about 10 feet away from Joel McHale at the glass house in like 2010. That's crazy. And I was looking at Joel McHale, like, I want to meet him. I want to meet him. I want to meet him. And now I've had coffee with him multiple times. And it's it's like, like I tell him that. I always tell him that story. I'm like, dude, I was 10 10 feet feet away away from you being like (laughs) too nervous to meet you. And now I'm sitting at your dining room table talking about like what we're doing next year. It just shows that it's like you, if you can maintain that momentum and hold on to that and stay hungry and stay motivated, if you don't quit, you're going to get there eventually. Mm-hmm. You, you really are. How do you, um, how do you cultivate, or I would say, how do you take on people that you know will work for you relentlessly and really not push your product, but have a passion for it and, you know, really encourage it because anybody can hire anybody, but how do you know like, okay, this person's it, they're going to help us right. and they care about it. It's a, it's a big um, question, but yeah, it is. But you know, a lot of the people who work for me, um, are Star Wars fans. Mm-hmm. They're they're from my Star Wars community. Um so common connection. You know, not ex- yeah. right, not exclusively that, but what I've learned is if if you, you know, we've we've got this this cool little community and you hire from that community, they have more motivation to succeed mm-hmm. than if they had no attachment to you because now it's like, hey, we're friends working together, let's do more. Let's mm-hmm. make more. Like Taylor, my content guy, um we were the only two in marketing for about a year and a half. And every day we'd be like, all right, let's get in the car. Where are we going? What are we doing? And, and we both had this drive to be the best, even though we were both sorely underpaid and Mm -hmm. and not making any money. It was kind of like surrounding yourself with people like that. Now we have a lot of other people that, you know, come from like the designers and engineers come from really different backgrounds, impressive backgrounds. Yeah. And it's like those people, it's like they're self-motivated and and you're always going to find great people like that who, who take ownership. But we also hire a lot from the super 73 community. Mm -hmm. So people who love what we do, um, you know, we've had a lot of them that just hung around so much that they eventually getting got brought on staff because we'd start asking them to do things and legally we've got to pay them. So we would just hire them. That's amazing. Um, what, speaking of like your community and the, the whole group itself, what made you think of doing group rides, you know, then like bring people together and doing something and actually, you know, <laughs> people are together. Yeah. It's the same common theme. You know, you know, it was, it was always like, don't ride alone. It mm-hmm. was, that was the earlier mentality is like, don't ride alone. But we, we noticed very early on that the people who were buying the bikes were finding each other online mm-hmm. and then riding with each other. Oh, that's amazing. And that was kind of born from itself. We had a, the creative director over at K1 Speed, which is like a go-kart track, he was a huge fan of Super 73. Wow. And he was like, hey, you guys, like this is a, a really cool community. Uh, he started to host a couple of group rides. We ended up hiring him and he's now basically our community overseer. That's great. Um, but yeah, he, you know, he was, he was instrumental in that, in being at every single group ride and, and people just wanted to hang out and have a good time. It was all about hanging with friends. Mm-hmm. Everybody who bought one of those first 500 Super 73s felt like our friends because right. we were directly right. talking to them, directly like updating them on our problems. And by the end of that relationship, when you give them their bike, they're like, I love you, man. I'm attached. And, and it was yeah. very mutual, you know? Um, what do you, what's your favorite part about um, the community? Is it like, Hey, I made this and I built it and we're doing stuff together. Or is like, what do you enjoy most 
about seeing your product being used or like, yeah. Um, you know, I think in the early days I was very connected with the community. I was at every single group ride. I was at every event. And then as, as business got trickier and things got crazier, I kind of pulled back a little bit because Mm -hmm. I noticed that there were a lot of complaints for lack of a better word. There's things that as we had growing pains were becoming kind of problematic. Got it. Um, things that we've been working to address and obviously any company through rapid growth is, is going to get stretched, but it, it did kind of spook me a little bit, but there was one person, uh, his name is Tristan. Um, he was like a beacon of hope for all of us here at super 73. When it came to his content, uh, he had so much passion, so much joy. He was so willing to talk about like, Hey, this is, these are the issues super 73 is having. Here's why they're having them. Here's how it's going to get better. And it was like, he was our, our shining light. And so people like Tristan have, have kept me fired up about this job. Um, whether they know it or not a lot when, when it gets tough. And I think seeing those types of people in the community that are giving back, they're actively bringing more people in. It's kind of the same thing as the star Wars community. I showed up with a helmet. Suddenly I had friends for life, Mm -hmm. you know, people show up with a bike and suddenly they have friends for life. It's a really cool sort of, uh, energy. Yeah. So people who are really like, Hey, here's a problem and here's a resolve. Hey, they're still great. And then here's the why and how it's going to get resolved. That's cool. Yeah. And, and it's been, it, there's been a lot of them and Tristan, just one example, but there's, there's so many versions of, of, you know, Tristan and his story where it's the people who really understand what you're trying to do. Mm. Um, we're not trying to make a quick buck. If we were, we would have started a t-shirt company. <laughs> we would not have started an electric vehicle company. We're trying to do something big. And the people in the community that understand that those are the ones who keep us going. Mm. It's like, we're going to have a misstep. We had a misstep in 2020 because of production. We didn't know that we'd be sold out of our entire year's inventory in the first month. Wow. Like we just didn't know demand would be that high. And so that caused a lot of problems, um, that, you know, your average consumer is going to be like, Oh, well, super 73 failed. They couldn't hold inventory this whole year. The people who understand what we're doing are like, no, this is a, this is huge. Yeah. The fact that they sold out of all their inventory to month is unheard of. And so that's where it's like, you see those kind of bright spots in the community and and you're like, we can keep doing this. We can keep going. Mm -hmm. Um, What do you enjoy most about doing custom builds for celebrities or like people like Raul or like being able to do that for those people? Um, You know, it started out, it was like, I kind of just built a checklist of all the people I wanted to meet. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and that's what made me so passionate to do it was getting to meet the people that I had admired. And because I was giving them a product, I got to meet them. I was like a peer, which was so interesting because everybody's always like, don't meet your idols. Don't meet your idols. Every single person we've worked with, every person we've met has been so wonderful. And I think that it's genuinely because we really appreciate what they're doing and we express it through the bikes that we make. So, um, in the case of Rahul, like what a wonderful guy, the internet loves him. Um, producers love him. He seems like he's going to have kind of an explosive career here pretty soon. And for us, it was like, this guy deserves a bike. Um, and we became pretty good friends through the process, uh, just because he's a fellow star Wars fan. Um, but that's what we do. We look at people who are talented, who are doing cool things and using their platform for good. Rahul speaks up a lot about, you know, current issues. And so somebody who's, who's able to do that and, and can, can successfully have a career through that is somebody that we definitely want to be working with. How do you create a work environment that's so fun yet so serious and you're like, hey guys, we got to work, we're going to do stuff fast and here are all these <laughs> orders, but like you guys keep it fun. And it seems like I've seen the the Converse video and I'm all like, how are you guys fulfilling all these orders and doing all this dope stuff at the same time? So yeah, how do you, how do you guys do that? Well, the, I'll, I'll give you like a, I'd actually like to say this to a lot more people. Yeah. Our marketing team is very much separated from the operations of the company. Mm -hmm. Uh, If somebody's riding around super 73 in a Santa outfit or on a bike made of Converse or in a, on a bike that looks like a dog, they have nothing to do with fulfillment of orders. It's its own department. It's its own department. Yeah. A lot of, and a, dude, I, that comment, I have seen I'm that so comment. I'm so sorry. <laughs> 10, 000, no, no, no. It's good. It wasn't, it wasn't you. I'm just saying I've seen this comment 10,000 times of yeah. like, you guys, you seriously going to ride around in a dinosaur costume? Ship my bike. I'm like, dude, 
Liam is 19 years old. You don't want Liam you want to be some, shipping yeah. your bike. <laughs> Let Liam ride around in a dinosaur costume. So it is all separated. And I think the marketing team has been able to kind of bring a lot of joy to the rest mm -hmm. of the company when it gets difficult. Um, we kind of are, 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 are the bearers of fun and silly times, whether we're riding a unicycle or jumping through a ring of fire or, you know, crashing at full speed in front of the building for everybody to see. It's about like having those brief moments throughout the week uh, where Good the employees are like, oh yeah. yeah, this is why we're doing this. This is fun. This is, a, it breaks up the day. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, hey, customer service is not out there jumping through rings of fire, people, if you're listening. <laughs> Just so everyone knows. Uh, there's separate department, separate department. Right. Uh, do you have a, um, cause it seems like you've worked with everyone or like you've made a lot of collaborations. Do you have a dream collaboration that's still out there? It's so weird because I did for so long. And then we just, we did them all. We mm -hmm. did post Malone. We did Sway Lee. We did Will Smith. Uh, I, it's, it's like who else, you know? Yeah. And, and I think we have our, our, you know, our, our big tier kind of like, like I want to make all the Avengers bikes. Yeah. Like that's a yeah. big one for me is like, I want an Iron Man bike, Captain America bike. I want a Hulk bike and I want to give them to the actors. Um, that would be so cool. But for me now at this point, it's like we've realized that we can have anything we go after. I'm almost more interested in doing the things now. Now we have the audience. Yeah. Now I want to do the things that are truly revolutionary with the tech. Um, we got the audience we wanted. We don't have to keep doubling down on that. We still will do really cool stuff with cool people. Of course. But yeah. now I think the entire company is kind of aligned and focused on like, how can we make this company Tesla? How can we make it Apple? How can we make it Nike? Mm -hmm. Taking things into the grand um, scale of things and not just making products for the sake of making products to be consumed, but really to revolutionize exactly. and push forward the idea of like, this isn't just a bike company. We do great, awesome things and we're getting bigger and this is our plan. Yeah. yeah and, and we always, you know, we call ourselves an electric vehicle company yeah. because we don't ever want to be, you know, put in a box and uh, we're developing some really cool stuff here. It's going to be hitting this year, next year, year after that I think is going to really show the world like, hey, we are far from just a what bike think marketing company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how did you guys think or because I remember seeing um, I was doing while I was doing research, there's this thing called the Great Escape Time Trials at Moto Ranch. What made you guys mm -hmm. want to get into that? I would say market and then just do like something that's like exclusively Super 73. Was it just about showing like, hey, we can do something that's super cool with performance and shocks and we can do it and here it is. Or what was the, what was the idea behind doing it? First, again, I just want to commend you on your research is super impressive. <laughs> Thank like, you. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, um, so Indian motorcycles mm. is, is Amazing a company. great example. Yeah. Uh, they were a racing company. Mm. They, they grew a big audience because of racing. Same with Husqvarna. And we realized, hey, if we are going to be a great company, we need to compete. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to compete against others. We just need to be competitive. And so we actually, the 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 time trial started quite quite a long time ago, 2018, 2019, 2019. Um, we joined Roland Sands in the super hooligan race oh, uh, awesome. where we went across the US and we just let the motorcycle racers before they race their motorcycles, mess themselves up on super 73. So they were like kicking each other, punching each other, like riding past. Yeah. And it, it kind of yeah. created this cool race culture within super 73 that, uh, you know, we did the, the time trials with, um, uh, you know, there was a, there was a bunch of, a bunch of different, uh, uh, motorcycle manufacturers there. And they kind of got to see like, Oh, these super 73 guys, they're, they're, yeah. they're kind of, they're kind of coming up. Um, and, you know, once the world opens back up, we do want to go back to actually having like monthly races and mm -hmm. we have a whole thing kind of built out for that. But uh, vehicle companies do way better when they're racing companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually had the idea. I'm not trying to pitch it to you, but like, I'm all like, what if there was a massive like event at Angel Stadium? Because they normally do like BMX events. I'm like, what if you just took the giant community in Orange County and did like a giant racing event where like, there's an amateur league, there's a pro league, there's a semi league. And then like, here are the professional people. I'm like, that would be such a cool idea. Yeah. Just, I mean, we yeah. have, and, and that's why now sure we've been getting way it, more yeah. into, right. Well, we've been getting into performance bikes for that very reason. Mm. It's hard to race an, an S1 or a Z1, you yeah, know, it's definitely. like, it's just not, but the new RX line is like, okay, well, hang on. Now there's something here. We could kit those and mod those to 
either do way more, go way further and, and, and actually have a, a racing league. And then of course COVID hit. So it kind of put all that on hold. On stop, yeah. Um, but that's, yeah. that's a big one for us. We, we definitely want to do that. And I'll race. I want to race. I love racing. So yeah. Um, I'm in. How do you keep in mind, um, the community or like listening to them? Is it about looking at the comments, asking just content creators? Like, where do you go as like the golden star of, okay, this is what our community says and we need to do it. Or do you just do face to face? You ask people. Yeah. How do you go about that? Yeah. We're really attached to the community. We have a lot of people. I mean, I mean, our guys are at every group ride. Um, you know, they're, they're in direct communication. I'm, I'm very available. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's funny. I'm, I, I'm on Reddit a lot. I'm on Instagram a lot. I'm constantly responding to things I can respond to. Um, because we do care. Like we genuinely care about what the community thinks. Cause if the community has an idea, then it's probably something we should do. Mm -hmm. Um, we've also, they just show up, <laughs> they yeah. just show up and they're like, Hey, I have these ideas. And if there's somebody around who can listen, we, we want that to happen. So we are very much in touch with them. We give back to them as much as we can. We try to take care of them. Um, so it is a, it is a really cool kind of back and forth. Mm -hmm. Um, at any point from the whole success, did you ever get ego minded? If you, if you ever did, um, how did you kind of rein yourself down from that? Yeah. You know, success changes people for sure. Yeah. We've had, you know, people in our lives that as we started to become successful kind of showed that they weren't necessarily on the same page. Mm -hmm. And that's always been something that's really interesting. Um, for me, man, uh, just to, to be blunt, it's, it's hard to be egotistical when you look around and see the people you're playing with. Right. You look around and be like, and I'm like, we got Polaris, we got Indian, we got, um, you know, Harley Davidson over there. We have Tesla, we have bird Lyft. we are small. And so no, there's no room for ego in the walls of super 73, because I think we all know that, um, you're competing. We are far from done. Mm -hmm we, we made a successful bike company. That's cool. But if we stopped it there, it would be selling ourselves and our community so short. So, um, you know, I think people will assume egos of, mm. of, you know, Legrand, Aaron and myself. Um, but <laughs> it's, I mean, it's like, yeah, I get to take cool pictures with Will Smith and Post Malone. Yeah. It doesn't mean that I'm done working. And yeah. I think, you know, egotistical people normally feel like they're done working, like they did what they're going to do. And so, um, we, we've always been very like-minded in that we are far from done and far from at a place where we can relax. So I don't think the ego has Take room it. to, yeah. uh, to get in now after I'm, if I'm walking through Coachella with Post Malone, it feels pretty cool. Like yeah. I, it does, yeah, yeah. but then, you know, you, you get back to reality and you're like, that's literally nothing. It means nothing beyond a cool photo op. I'm a human it's being. time to get back mm -hmm. to work. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to, um, to give to someone or like an entrepreneur who's scared to step in and start a business or start a clothing brand or do something. Cause I feel like from your experience and your perspective and wisdom, I feel like there'll be some good things to hear. Well, thank you for that. Um, you know, I, t I talk about this a lot of like the fear of starting, mm. um, those who are afraid to start will never taste success because you didn't take the first step. Um, it's very easy to wake up and go through your routine and stay safe and then go home and watch Netflix. It's very easy to do that. And in, in a lot of ways, it's far more rewarding at the time to do that. Um, but what separates, you know, that level of success and existing is wanting more and wanting to pursue more and to pursue it for the right reasons and to wake up and say, I could die tomorrow. I will do everything in my power to make sure that I have done everything I can do today. And that's kind of been my mentality is it's time to go. We're, we're not getting any younger. You know, when I started this thing, I was, um, I was like 25 and I would say what I did and people would be super impressed. Yeah. They'd be like, wow, you're 25. Oh my goodness. That's so cool. And now that I'm 29 and I say it, people are like, okay, cool. Good job. Yeah. And it, and it just, and it just, it Adult wakes you up, dude. And you're like, yeah. And you're like, oh, I got, I got to move because people that are 29 are already doing way more than I'm doing. And so it's about always staying hungry and saying like, look, here's the truth. And this is my truth because it's, it's the, I only have my own experiences, but the way I've done things, nothing, I always say nothing's real. 
there's no real consequence outside of death um, of when it comes to chasing success. Now, if you're wanting to build something and wanting to do something, what's the worst thing that can happen? You go broke and lose all your money and lose your house and you lose your car and you have to start over. Fine, then you have to start over. But it doesn't mean that you failed. And that's the thing is a lot of people do something and they don't have instant success and they call it a failure. Mm -hmm. I did this for four years before anybody cared, you know, and that's what it kind of comes down to is now it's cool. We get to be on podcasts and talk to cool people like yourself and uh, take pictures with Will Smith. There was like a decade before that where I was floundering around trying to figure out what to do. But every morning I woke up and I got to work. And so for those who are looking for a way to start one, connect with like-minded people, there's lists out there, type in Orange County startups. They are desperate for work. Now you're not going to make any money, uh, yeah. but you might have an opportunity that will change your entire life. Uh, a good example is I, I had a partner um, in my my Acros Media business uh, that needed a paycheck, and it's just how he operated. He was like, "Look, man, we've been at Nimble, which was the scooter company. We've been here for quite a while. We haven't gotten a paycheck. I'm starting to get a little antsy." And I was like, "Dude, there's no money to be made here." And and he was like, "Well." I, I don't want to keep doing this. And so I told him, I said, well, look, we've made a total of $1,200 since we started $1,200 over the course of like six months. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was like, I will give you 600. I'll give you my half. If you give me the other half of, of the percent yeah. of equity that we split. And he said, yes. And he took it cause he wanted the paycheck and that's not bad. It's not bad that he wanted the paycheck. I understand that mentality very well. Um, but two months later, we founded super 73 mm -hmm. two months later, two months, if he had been able to hold on for two more months, um, you know, it would be vastly different. And that's the thing. And maybe you dig for two more months and maybe you dig for two more years or 10 more years. It's, it's, if you don't stop digging, eventually you're going to find the gold. Mm -hmm. How has, um, especially during those hard times, did you run into any like depression or like self doubt and I'm a millennial dude. No, you're, I think I, we, I, we thrive on depression. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then depression um, keeps us going. Did you use um, like your spiritual side to really help you through that? Or what did you use to help you through that time? Or was it just self talk and you're like, okay, I'm going to be fine. This is going to be okay. It's going to work out. We're just in the struggle. Yeah. You know, my spirituality is, is very important to me and it's, it's ever kind of growing and evolving and changing and, I'm looking at the world differently, especially through the events of 2020 and, yeah. and seeing like, Hey, who's, who's saying what? Um, but you know, my, my belief that there is, that there is a creator and, and, and that, you know, that kind of is like that we are here to work. Um, there's a, there's, you know, the, the Bible talks a lot about work and putting in work and building things. And so that to me was always like, yeah, we're supposed to be working. Our goal is to work and make things and like uh, try to leave the world, but as a better version of, of what it was than, than yeah. what we found it. Um, so that definitely helped. But, you know, I think when you lose everything, it it's hard to, it's almost easier to keep going when you lose everything because you have nothing else to lose. That's true. When I'm yeah. sitting pretty and I have money in the bank and things are fine. I'm not nearly as hungry or as desperate. And it's been a hard thing is like, now it's like, oh, now we get paychecks, mm -hmm. you know, for the longest time we didn't pay ourselves. And now it's like, oh, okay, we have paychecks, stay hungry. Mm -hmm. Uh, even though now you're, you have rent paid and you can buy groceries. Um, we purposely don't, we don't pay ourselves too well here. Uh, the, at least the founder, the founding staff, because it's important to us that we show not only our team, but our investors that like, Hey, we're not done. We're staying hungry. Like yeah. we got to keep hustling. Um, so that's been, that's been really helpful, uh, you know, along the way to, to kind of maintaining a healthy mindset is saying like, first, what can the world do to me? Nothing, mm -hmm. literally nothing. I, if I lose all of my money, I'll start over again. And tomorrow if I lose it, it's, it is what it is. I'm telling you, I'll start over again. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a good mentality. And I think, being okay with being depressed, um, you know, not to get too heavy, but we all deal with it. We all deal with depression in one stage or another about one thing or another and feeling like that's okay. You can live with that. As long as you just keep taking little steps, you don't have to change the world overnight. Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't have to feel better overnight. It's okay to not feel okay. Um, that's, that's a good mindset to have. And, and that too will keep you wanting more and to keep wanting to do better. If you had the chance during that time period, 
would you tell yourself anything of what you know now from your experience? Would you tell yourself anything or would you keep it as is? Because it, like, <laughs> like, it seems like your perspective is very a lot vaster than I think people see on the surface. And I, and I, for one, I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it's more fun to talk about silly things than to talk about, of course. Like, yeah. you know, and so I think that's why for the most part, it's stupid TikToks that make me look dumb that go viral, you know? Uh -huh. um, but, uh, I, you know, I think looking back, it's my advice to myself would be to, if anything, maybe be a little bit more careful, maybe be more thoughtful in who I interact with in how I present myself and how I kind of build this business. Um, you know, because I think I, I got, I got bit, I got stung a few times and, uh, it's going to happen. We're all going to get stung and we're going to get bit a few times. You trust the wrong people, you make the wrong deals and you kind of have to go back and reset. If I could change anything, it would be to make no enemies. Like mm -hmm. don't, involve yourself with people who are not like-minded because you're going to make enemies. It's just going to make it the road longer. Like there's things that don't need to be drawn out that get drawn out. Yeah. So I think my advice would be into anybody starting a business, you're not going to get along with people. You're just not, there's going to be people that you're at odds with. You don't have to make them an enemy. You can part ways graciously. You can hold your tongue and say, you know what, we're going to go our separate ways, but I respect you and I appreciate your help. Um, have a good life. Uh, I think that would be the one thing that if anything would make it easier, it would be to, to have, to have not, um, gotten into it with people who don't understand what we're doing. Right. Um, getting into a little bit of that, that area, when you see people who do have, I would say, quote unquote, copycat ideas or things that look similar, do you feel hate or do you feel more like, Oh, that's a compliment because we do something really good and they decided to copy it. How do, Cause I'm curious on how you feel about it. You know what I mean? Right. You know, earlier and you, you hit the nail on the head with like on that same thread, like I, dude, it made me so mad. It would make me so mad when people would knock us off. Yeah. Um, it got my blood boiling. And, and in some cases I would like, I would directly go at the founder and I'd be like, what do you, what do you think you're doing? Yeah. Do you think, would you think I'm a joke? Do you think that like, I'm not going to notice Figure this, it out. Yeah. Um, you know, down to the way they name things or the way that they, they market things there's no need, whatever, man, there's, there's 7 billion of us on the planet. I'll sell bikes to somebody else. So yeah. for me, it, it actually has, I've, I've learned that it helps because all these knockoffs come out and everybody thinks the knockoffs are super 73s too. And so it, it does help us a lot because, you know, uh, a celebrity will see a bike that looks like ours, take a photo, post it online, be like, anybody know what bike this is? The majority of the people say, we'll say super 73. Yeah. So it's like, okay, you played yourself. Um, yeah. and I didn't have to say anything. So again, holding my tongue, being more wise with the words I use, um, and not making enemies. So knockoff companies, they're, they're like gnats. It mm -hmm. doesn't, it doesn't matter, especially yeah. at the volumes that, that super 73 is doing now. Would you say with marketing, is it, or yeah, I guess would you say for advice, whether it's people who are in clothing, selling cameras, audio tech, or like what you're doing with selling bikes, would you say their main focus should be what, what you do? how you do it and the craftsmanship you do with it and then the fun you can do with it. Or like, what should people be focusing on? Cause I, I'm gonna share a little bit, like I own a clothing brand and I realized when we were doing our marketing campaign on Instagram and TikTok and a bunch of those other areas, we showed it, it looked cool. The pre presentation was great, but we never showed the why, how, and what of what mm. we do. So what would you say? <laughs> oh, yeah. Cause like, I feel like I missed it. And I feel like even with your TikTok content, of course it's always fun and it's great and everything looks, awesome compliments to you. And even with super 73 phenomenal, but, um, what advice would you give to someone even in my area of how we should go about marketing in a good way? Not just like, Oh, just do this. This isn't the real advice. Yeah. Like to, to be important. Yeah. I mm -hmm. understand that. And, and we miss the mark sometimes too. I mean, everybody does like, yeah. you just have to be okay with losing and failing. Like every day I fail at doing something. Um, but that's okay. Cause I'm going to learn to do it better the next time. So for us, it was about building the bones. Like a lot of these companies aren't building the bones, which is how will my product change your life? That's mm -hmm. what's important. It, it's like, people don't understand that you are presented with a thousand different options every for day. every single decision you make every single day. And you're making these decisions based on what best suits you in the moment. So with the bikes, you know, and, and, and 2020 was a great example. We caught on early that we were going to 
have quite a boom because public transportation was shutting down. People needed to get out. And so we there switched all need. of our marketing up to, to be about, Hey, you can still adventure. Your life isn't over. Get out there. And we showed empty streets, bikes tearing through these streets, bikes tearing through the wilderness. And it inspired people to do it, use the electric bike in a way that they hadn't before. And, you know, with closing clothing companies, it's, if I, turn, if I open Instagram, by the time I'm 10 photos in, half of them are ads for a t-shirt company. Yeah. And so for me, I always say like, how does this product truly interact with the user? And I look at Gen Z for a lot of that. And the reason why I'm on TikTok, it was actually a case study. Um, for about three months before I jumped on, I was like, I was telling my wife, Janae, I was like, look, I want to understand this algorithm. I want to understand how Gen Z consumes information, consumes products and interacts with brands. So I didn't want to hop on with Super 73 in case I failed. I didn't, I didn't want it to be inauthentic. So I hopped on as with myself. After about three months, I told Janae, I said, I think I can do this. I think I've got it. Watch. Let's do that experiment. First video yeah. got a million views. Second video got a million views. And I just kept doing it. And then I was like, okay, I got this. It'll work. Then I went to make one for Super 73. And I realized like, I can't authentically do that. Mm -hmm. I can't authentically talk to the consumers, Gen Z, because I'm 29 years old. I'm a dinosaur to them. It didn't work. So I had met this kid named Liam. Um, he was working at Subway at the time. He had no qualifications to join uh, Super 73's marketing team, except that he had developed a following of his own mm -hmm. through really authentic content. And I said, hey, dude, come do Super 73's TikTok. Uh, don't worry about the bikes. Just do it as if Liam was going to make TikToks at a Himself. company. Yeah. And as a result, they're weird, man. They're re I mean, he just crossed 2 million likes total uh, on Jeez. the year, which is awesome. Yeah. He's been doing it for about uh, eight months. Mm. Um, you know, we, we have things we want to fix and do better, but it it we found a way to authentically communicate to an audience through TikTok, and it's to not try to sell them things. Every time we try to sell them something, it falls flat. But every yeah. time we show them cool something stuff. really cool or fun, yeah, it it blows up. Hmm. So I, I'm i in a marketing class right now. I'm just learning. I go to school at LMU. And so there's, we were just talking about this in class the other day. So different, um, I would say different approach for um, Snapchat. I'm oh, sorry, different approach for TikTok than you would advertise on things on Instagram. So two yeah. different perspectives. So it's like speaking two different languages on how you should present that content. I have totally different teams on each platform for that very reason. Mm -hmm. Instagram is much more matured content in that it needs to be more refined. It needs to speak to a larger audience. It needs to be less offensive. Yeah. I don't care what Liam does on TikTok because it's, it can be it's free. TikTok yeah. And I know Liam's got a good heart and he's not going to get us canceled. Um, with Instagram, it's hard to post a photo of a bike in the middle of a field without offending someone. So you have to be very thoughtful about the content you create on that platform. And that, as a result, like our ads on Instagram, they're refreshing like every two weeks because mm -hmm. you have to be so connected and what's going on. Yeah, exactly. And it always shifts and changes. Mm -hmm. So you would say, um, I guess your advice for me of what I can kind of take from that is present what you do um, in a super effective way that speaks to each of those communities on those platforms. So like, for example, um, I plan on doing like a, a motor racing drop for like, I don't know if you follow racing, but it's like group B, which is like an eighties, like rally era. And there's a, okay. there's a similar, um, a similar company out of Costa Mesa, which kind of does the same thing. So I'm looking to compete with them and I think I can do it in a different way. Not trying to rattle the chain, but, um, I think, I think I got some good advice from you. So I, I really appreciate well, it. Well, right. And yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I'll necessarily have all, all of the answers for you. I can only kind of tell you what's worked for me. Yeah. Um, but that was the biggest thing is my naivete. Again, I didn't know how bike companies were advertising their bikes. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're advertising them terribly. Uh, and that was it. It was like, I was like, I, I advertised my bike. Like I was a YouTuber. Mm -hmm. That's the only way I knew how to do it. I connected with people authentically and I was like, what's up everyone? It's Michael here at super 73. And so I'm going to be talking about why our bikes are made out of steel. Like whatever the case was, it was me connecting with them and then showing them a product and not taking myself seriously. I would in some cases purposely knock something over mid video wow. uh, because that allowed me to relate to somebody better. There's a video where I'm, I'm, ad I'm addressing 
uh, our new warehouse. And I'm like, this is what we're doing. We're building out a storefront. And as I kind of make a gesture, I knock over an entire cup of pins. <laughs> there was no reason for the cup of pins to be there yeah. except for me to knock it over because I knew that that would relate me to the audience in a way that I seemed in that video to be a little bit like, look at our new building. We're growing so much. It's so great. I allowed myself to be humbled on camera mm. so that they were like, ah, oh, this guy, like we, we, we like this. Good job, man. You're doing yeah. a great job. Keep it up. You make people cheer for you. You make people want, and it's all authentic. Like, you know, and, and obviously the pins, it was like a, a thought process of like, oh, I should knock these pins over, but it's because I knock pins over all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I'm, I'm constantly tripping. And like just the other day, I knocked over an entire cubicle partition <laughs> uh, in customer service because I just, that's, that's who I am. And so to authentically show that with our audience really connected with people. Mm -hmm. how, um, how would you describe your daily routine? Or do you have a daily routine or you just get up and just go about the day? Routine's dangerous here at Super 73 because it's just, you don't know what you're walking into. I have a schedule that says what my meetings are and then that's gonna change 10 times in a day. And so for me and the marketing team, it's always, it's again, that line, be remarkable today. How are we gonna be remarkable? Did we do anything remarkable? And a lot of days, the answer is no. A lot of days you fail. But if you keep every single day waking up and having your goal to be remarkable, you're gonna hit the target a lot. And we, and we do hit it a lot and that's why these things tend to go, you know, where they go, whether they're viral or just well in, engaged with. Uh, there's a lot that we're able to do with a small team because our only goal at the end of the day is to be a company that's worth talking about. Mm -hmm. How do you define entrepreneurship? Because I feel like through your experiences, that word or that definition has definitely changed over the time. So how would you present today? How would you define it? Yeah, you know, and such a big word. <laughs> And I hate it for yeah. so many reasons because it got dragged. It got dragged through the mud and it was something I didn't want to identify with for a long time because everybody I'd gone to high school with that had like a marketing business that they built called themselves an entrepreneur, even though there was no product to show for it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I was always like, I'm not going to call myself an entrepreneur until I've done it, until I'm doing it. And even now, like 10 years down the line, I don't know if I would still call myself that, um, and I'm honored anytime anybody does, but it, it's kind of like, it's never enough. It yeah. can't ever be enough. And that's, I think what maybe entrepreneurship is, is you're never done. You're key. I'm already on to like three more ideas, uh, beyond this. And, and obviously this is what I'm working on now. So this is where my focus is, but it's that mentality of staying active, staying moving and, and never being okay. And never saying like, I did it. Mm -hmm. It's where you don't let the ego come in. And, and the reason why the word entrepreneur is kind of soiled is because there's so many egos involved in it. And, yeah. um, I think an entrepreneur doesn't have an ego because an entrepreneur has to stay hungry. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's somebody who, who, yeah, won't settle and just keeps, keeps going. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to, um, I would say someone in college who is about to graduate and they don't know what, they don't know what they want to do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, that's tough, man. I, uh, I, I obviously dropped out of college, um, multiple times and it finally stuck. Uh, and I dropped out for good, but I, I am so jealous of people who have gone to college because of the networking abilities there you just the ability to communicate with other people that are like-minded and interested in things. I think if I had gone, I would have developed, developed a much better network. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would say lean on the people around you. If I, if I was currently in college and, and about to come out, I would find the, the two or three people around me that had attributes that I don't have. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, I have no organization skills and I have no real like numbers. So no, yeah. no accounting skills, no projection skills, technical. So Aaron and Legrand are both really organized and well built by the numbers. But the thing that they're not is spontaneous and creative mm. and in that way. So, um, you know, Aaron is, is in charge of brand. So everything is down to the exact degree. Everything is like precisely where it should be. And I'm more like take the paint and throw it at the canvas. And if I didn't have Aaron and Legrand, I wouldn't be where I am today. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you that if they didn't have me, they wouldn't be where they are today. So it's a really cool kind of unit that you're like, we're not complete unless we're together. And that's what's helped us to stick with each other through the years. Did you ever, um, cause like I said, uh, referencing research, you would say 
your entrance into entrepreneurship was to get freedom or quote unquote freedom. Mm -hmm. Was there any time in that process that you felt free or do you feel free now or or, or would you would you just re reprise? I love you your said? questions, I, by the way. I, I do you. a lot of podcasts where I just meander for a long time and then we wrap it up. This is you. You, you have great questions. So um, it's funny. I actually went to the parking lot today <laughs> and it was a relatively warm day and I took my mask off and I stood in the sun and I was like and I was transported back to freedom. Mm. Um, the ability to be outside in the middle of a work day and enjoy nature. And, and I had that for a long time. It wasn't financial freedom, yeah. but it, it was freedom to just go where the wind would take me. And I really enjoyed that feeling. And I remember, you know, I lived by myself and I was shooting weddings. So I was only working on the weekends. Um, and I was, I mean, I vacuumed my house at nine 30 in the morning and then vacuum it again at 6 PM because wow. I just, I was trying to fill my time. I would mm -hmm. go on a walk. I would I would go to Disneyland and just walk around. Like it was truly freedom, like wow. un, unending freedom, but it wasn't enough. Uh -huh. And that's what's crazy is that it, it, I wanted more and I wanted better. And so I think while my mind was telling me that that feeling was freedom, I don't think that's true freedom. I think that true freedom is being able to take care of the people around you, take mm -hmm. care of yourself, have a structured sort of system built and, you know, and I, and I do say like, you know, maybe super 73 will sell or go public or whatever the case is. Um, maybe I'll have freedom then. Uh, yeah. but I think freedom is the ability to create what you want to create when you want to create it and not be held to anybody. Now that super 73 is blown up, my freedom's kind of taken away because I have a ton that I have to do every single yeah. day. Yeah. So it's like in the pursuit of ultimate freedom, I accidentally got, got myself more, more <laughs> locked in locked down than before, but I think it's part of the grand scheme of things. I think if I keep doing this, um, you know, I say like maybe the next thing will give me the freedom I'm looking for, but maybe I'm not looking for freedom at all beyond that short minute where I'm standing in the parking lot, able to take my mask off and breathe and enjoy the sun for a few minutes. Cause there is this, I promise you there's this feeling. It's the day I walked out of Costco, yeah. my final day, the sun hit me and I am telling you it hits, it hits in a different way. And it, <laughs> yeah. it's like a chemical release where you're like, I want more, I want more when you quit a job and, and you're like, I'm going to be okay. Um, so I think, you know, like freedom for me now is like, I don't want to be free until all my homies are free <laughs> until yeah. like yeah. everybody around <laughs> me also doesn't have to worry about that. So I think that's my new thing is like, maybe super 73 can be a tool to get the people, the creative people around me out of their jobs that, that, you know, they don't necessarily like, um, and on to doing, you know, more meaningful things that make them fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Um, weird question. Do you have, cause I thought of this from this perspective for someone who has success and quote unquote money or everything you could ever want. Do you have a fear that because you own a company that I'm just, is just random. That, me. That, that your kids will have privilege and then you try to like teach them like, Hey, you still got to do hard work, but like, absolutely. Cause like I, I've thought of it and I'm all like, well, mm -hmm. how do you have a successful company? And then try to raise your kids and then be like, Hey, by the way, go do hard work and do it. But then they're in that bubble. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, dude, I think about it a lot. I, I actually, I, that's a great question. Um, I grew up struggling, mm -hmm. like really struggling. Um, my parents had a really rough time of it for the first 24 years of my life, really rough time. Um, I moved out when I was 18, mm -hmm. basically on my 18th birthday. Um, and I had a great relationship with my parents, but it was like, we lived in a very small house. I shared a bedroom with my brother. A bedroom was like a 10 by 10. Um, and uh, he's two years older than I am. And we had twin beds and it, it was just like, it was just cramped. So I moved out. Um, and that kept me going, that kept me that kind of like struggle, get, mm -hmm. get you moving. Um, my mom told me, she goes, look, you're gonna, you're gonna struggle for four years. Probably she was, she was like, when you move out, consider this your college. If you drop out, because you are going to get schooled by the system for four years, or mm -hmm. you're going to get schooled by a system for four years. Yeah. Um, and that was great advice was to just get me hungry and motivated where she told me, Hey, it's going to be terrible. And that got me through a lot. Um, and she's great. And I mean, I, I have such a good relationship with my parents because of that. And so for me, when I'm looking at like down the road, having kids, 
yeah, I did. I want to kick them out when they're 18. Like I really do. I want <laughs> yeah. them to be like, Hey, taste the real world. And obviously I'll be there for them. And, and I don't, I'm, when I say kick them out, it's just for, it's for, you know, the laugh of it, but leaving the house at 18 changed my life mm-hmm. because it was go time. And if you don't pay rent, there are real consequences. I, I learned that there are very serious consequences to your actions at a very young age. Mm-hmm. And because of that, I want to be able to do that with my kids too. I won't be okay with them being privileged. Uh, yeah. I won't be okay just sending them to college, um, full ride, everything paid because they won't know the value of it. And yeah, and I, struggle. you know, my, my wife and I will not allow ourselves to forget that. Mm. Did you have an idol growing up? Just taking things back to older things or did you ever look up to anybody or was it just, hey, I'm mm. myself? Like some people will say, I mean, Michael my, Jordan. I, you know as, what I mean? as yeah. all Orange County kids did, I had my Eminem phase for a nice, minute. Nice, nice. Uh, back when I was like 13. Um, you know, I'll tell you, I think my first idol was Donald Glover. Mm. Uh, my senior year of high school, I discovered him. And uh, he was, ju- his music is so, back then it was so narrative. It was just his stories. He was just mm. rapping his stories and occasionally he'd go into like long, just, monologues yeah. and and bits where he's just talking and i encourage everybody to look up like old childish gambino songs um you know like hero or uh the the two weeks um the grizzly bear cover because the stories he tells in those are like so impactful mm-hmm. to somebody who wants success somebody who wants to be an entrepreneur um he was i mean he was preaching back then about like wanting to do more, running out of time, needing to do more. So I would say that was probably my first like idol, the guy that I was like, this is who I want to be like, not in that I want to be a rapper, but I want to be as passionate and hungry as he is. Mm -hmm. Can you give any advice to me? (laughs) I know. I mean, I do. I wish I had started a podcast. I mean, how old are you? Uh, I'm 21, just two days ago. So yeah. I'm so jealous. (sighs) I wish I was 21 again and I'm only eight years removed, but the amount of things I could have done in those eight years, if I had known, you mm-hmm. know, like, and you started a podcast and if nothing more, it allows you to talk to people who are doing stuff. Yeah. And that's the yeah. coolest thing ever. Um, the average career starts at 33 years old in the U S so you have from now until you're 33 to mess up and to blow it and to fail and to start over and to don't, be okay with a mediocre amount of success like a lot of your peers are going to be. And I Mm -hmm. think, you know, coming out of college, everybody gets a good job in sales or a good job in finance and and then they start flexing and then they start buying cars and they start buying nice clothes and it's going to make you feel like you're not doing enough. Mm -hmm. Don't be fooled by that. Don't, because every single kid out of my high school who had that lifestyle is now stuck in a golden pair of handcuffs. And oftentimes it's not even real gold where their job pays them too much for them to leave, yeah. but not enough yeah. for them to live. That makes sense. And yeah. what you're doing is you're going down a path that's going to kind of separate you from that. And like I said, like with earlier with Costco, if it, it's what you enjoy doing and you like the job, amazing, stay there, do that. Um, but if you feel like you could be doing more and you sleep on that feeling, then you are truly wasting your life and at 21, for you to have a podcast and a clothing company, it, it doesn't matter if it fails. Who cares if it fails? You did it. And now when you go to the next thing, you find the next people, you have this list of things you've done that will truly and genuinely help you be a better business person and a better human being. Mm-hmm. So, I, dude, I, I wish that I could go back and let you give me advice because you <laughs> seem to be far beyond where I was at your age. Um, I think just to wrap things up, do you have any questions for me? Um, I, I mean, I could, I could pick your brain for an hour. Uh, I mean, what is it, what is it you're trying to do? Um, why, why did this all start? Uh, which start clothing or, or the podcast? Everything. Why, why are you doing yeah. any of this at 21? I, that you just opened up a can of worms, my friend. <laughs> so I realized, so quick backstory, just to get real quick. So uh, I guess I'm going to say this. So early on when I was a kid, super privileged, m- Family had millions of dollars, owned another clothing company, blew up. It was called Dragonfly, partnered with a bunch of bands and rock and roll people like Stevie Nicks, um, Kiss, a bunch of people. And they just did licenses for so many years. And then all of a sudden, bankruptcy, rug, the whole rug got swept from under me. I lost everything, S- slept on a couch for like four years. And then I'm all like, holy shit, uh, excuse my language. 
holy shit. You're fine. Holy shit. It actually, it costs a lot of money to actually make a dollar. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, well, I'm 18. I'm about to go into my freshman year of college. What can I do? Because I'm all like, everyone either, A, they don't know what they want to do during college and they need to figure it out. And I'm all like, well, what do I like? And what do I want to express? And I'm like, well, I like clothing. And I like talking to people and getting to know their story. And I'm a communications major. So I'm like, let's do podcasting and let's do clothing. And then those were my two it things that I decided to focus on and and do. And that's kind of the short story version of my ethos. And I would say I love the process of creating and designing everything. And okay, this is what the t-shirt needs to look like. This is what the jacket needs to look like. But I'm the worst at marketing and I need to learn it. So I'm literally trying to consume as much marketing information as possible, as well as uh, I'm a big fan of, of Kanye. And he says, I okay. hate people who present... Um, products in a way that makes people feel bad about themselves. And I'm all like, I also agree with that. So I need to figure out how do I present my clothing that um, is car community related because I'm going to break off because I realized the last drop, this wasn't what, this wasn't what I was passionate about. This is actually what I want to do. And I just want to make clothing that has a deeper heritage in cars. And like, I'll explain it like this. If you go to a car show and you see a guy who has a Ferrari polo, a Ferrari hat and a Ferrari shoes, you're like, okay, that guy knows nothing about cars. But if you see a guy who has an AMG t-shirt and instead of it just saying AMG, it says, um, Auf Alterbach, which is a city in Germany, that's depth in the car community. Yeah. And I just want to make, lore, yeah. I just want to make clothing that has depth in the Mark. car community. So I'm working on that, but that's my next step. And that's the short version of what's happened over four years. So, yeah, I love that. I mean, if I could give you any advice on that, it's, you know, I love, I love Kanye too for the music and the spectacle. Um, he's a little bit out of his mind. So, yeah. so when he has <laughs> business advice, it's like, and I don't, I don't say that aggressively or as a dig. I really do genuinely, uh, think he is on another level of mm -hmm. thinking. Um, but you know, and, and, and in the same way that Elon's out of his mind, it's a good out of your mind. It's like, you kind of have to be that way, yeah. but don't yeah. let his chaotic, advice. And that seems like great advice that he gave, but a lot of times they give chaotic advice of that course. doesn't make sense unless you have the empire that they already have. Yeah. So for you, I think you're, I mean, dude, for you to tell me that that's huge because I've seen it in the star Wars world. I've also seen it in the merch world um, where, you know, rooster teeth is, it was a company I was very aware of growing up. It's Red like a media company. Yeah. <laughs> they're pushing it. They're pushing a hundred million a year in t-shirt sales alone. Mm -hmm. So huge. Yeah. Huge. They found a way to just like you, nobody else outside of the rooster teeth community understands those t-shirts. Mm -hmm. But if you see somebody else wearing that shirt, you understand. You're, you, you're instantly you're best in the friends. group. You're in the in group. Yeah. And that's the same thing you're doing. And that's so brilliant where it's kind of the same thing with the star Wars shirts where they just say one line or one word. Exactly. And it's like the only other people that are going to know that are star Wars fans, that community, but that's that community. why these merch companies are so successful because it becomes like a cult or like a fraternity. Um, and so that's, I mean, that sounds like a great idea. I think that's probably going to bring you a lot of success if you can figure out how to authentically Present market that. that to people. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, My advice would be, um, yeah. dude, give away all of your product, as much product as you can give away to influential people right now and still stay alive. Do that. Mm -hmm. Well, we, um, yeah, I've sent out some product to some stuff and like, other people we've interviewed, like I not trying to brag, just trying to tell you, um, we've interviewed sure. one of Kanye West, his personal producers. So I got to connect with him. Then we interviewed a guy who produces for Gucci Mane, famous Dex, Tory Lanez and like Freddie Gibbs. So like, he's like, Hey, if you ever like want to interview Travis, like, here's how you do it. You go to his engineer, you interview him, then you go here. So it's like, would you say take advantage of that? Because I've tried to send stuff out to those people and like half of them will post it and half of them won't post it. Like, Right. Should I, I should dude, I tell them the instructions of like, Hey, present it in this way. This is what you say is a caption or should I just free it? What do you think? As super as super 73. I have never won. We've never paid for anybody to have our bike in their photo. Of course. And we've never given any sort of guidelines for how you take a photo of the bike. If we give you product, mm -hmm. um, because it's authentic. Yeah. But what we did do early on was work with micro influencers, which are almost more important in starting a business because you infiltrate the community. So underrated. Yeah. A good example would be Sam Sheffer at the time uh, out of New York. He was one of like Casey's underlings. Uh, he only had like 10,000 subscribers. Um, 
he, we let him review our bike first, mm -hmm. one of our new bikes. Like he did the first review of it. That video got a million views. And wow. as a result, Jeez. we kind of came up together. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I mean. Like I would go to those car meets and find the most popular dude or girl there and go to them. Don't mm -hmm. worry about going to like the top dogs because they're getting, they're given so much free stuff. Dude, I own a bike company, but I get 15 packages a week. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, if I only own a bike company, I'm getting 15 packages. Just what imagine. is yeah. a real celebrity? Just yeah, you know, like somebody who actually has a, has a following, a large following and, and, and is beneficial to society. So I'm always like, dude, find the dudes that are going to wear that shirt every Saturday to the car meet. Yeah. Uh, you'll sell way more that way. That that's always my recommendation. That no, for real though, that means a lot. Cause I was, it was like, I was fine trying to find like the door on the house. And now like you just gave me the door. So I really appreciate that. That's awesome. I mean, I'm telling you like in, in Andy Milanakis was our first influencer. Mm -hmm. That should say something that yeah. should say a lot. We didn't start with Will Smith. We didn't start with Casey Neistat. Um, start smaller, start with more grassroots. You are going to find so much success in doing that. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, cool. thank you for listening to another episode of your passion podcast. Just to wrap it up, we're going to have him say all of his uh, social medias and where you can follow him at, and we'll end it. Uh, yeah, cool. Thank you. Well, one, thank you for having me. Yeah. It was really awesome to on. chat. Thank yeah. you for asking really cool, unique questions. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Michael Canavo. That's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-C-A-N-N-A-V-O. Uh, Super 73 across the board is just at Super 73. And then if you are a Star Wars fan or you're into Star Wars stuff, you can find me anywhere um, using the username Rexin underscore around, R-E-X-I-N underscore around. And that's for like, don't bother with that unless you're a Star Wars fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. All right. Cool. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Have a great day. Bye.